Hello, welcome to another Tonalist Landscape oil painting demonstration. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy. And the painting I'm bringing you today is a, a study after Jules Dupree, um, the, his painting called La Mer aux Charenis. I French is not a good language for me, but uh, I'm really just riffing on it. I'll, I'll let you know straight up that his painting had... Um, a lot of things that I chose not to do. For one, it was like encrusted with tons of tiny detail, and I imagine his original was quite large. Um, also, some of his shapes and forms I modified more to my liking. I'm not saying I'm better than Dupree, but it's my painting and I'll do what I like. <laughs> Which, you know, maybe we'll talk about that because I talked about this quite a lot as I was doing the study. Um, which, you know, you can see the full version in the members area. There'll be a link right under the video. Um, and the nice thing about that, those videos is that's about two and a half hours long. Um, but it's a full painting session. So as we're in the throes of the uh, battle, so to speak, um, you're getting insights and inputs from me as to my approach. Also, I share a color mixing session. Um, the color mixing session, the main one, and not, not, not all the bits that I modify as I'm going, um, but also a bit at the uh, foreground where I talk about the things I'm changing and why. Um, you know, Jules Dupree was absolutely amazing, and I'm going to give you a little, before we get into all that other stuff, let's, let's get in a little bio if you haven't heard of him, okay? Here we go. This is from Wiki Art, Visual Art Encyclopedia. Jules Dupree, born April 5th, died uh, a April 5th, 1811, and died October 6, 1889. He lived a very long life. And I suspect that this painting uh, that I made a study of is one of his older ones because his work got a lot more loose and expressionist uh, as um, time progressed, you know, and that's a, a normal course of progression for almost all painters, really. But um, was very, very marked um, in the 1800s guys because uh, they started from a, a, an area where everything was just encrusted with tiny details. And by the uh, closing of the, um, the of that century, you know, everyone was a lot looser and more free. Let's read you his biography, though. Um, Jules Dupree was a French painter, one of the chief members of the Barbizon School of Landscape Painters. If Corot stands for the lyric and Rousseau for the epic aspect of the poetry of nature, Dupree is the exponent of his tragic and dramatic aspects. It's not his. Dupree was born uh, in Nantes, exhibited first at the Salon in 1831, and three years later was awarded a second-class medal. In the same year, he came to England, where he was impressed by the genius of Constable. That explains a lot. This painting that we're doing today has a Constable feel. I didn't know that, by the way. Uh, from then on, he learned how to express movement in nature and the districts around Southampton and Plymouth, with its wide and broken expanses of water, sky, and ground gave him good opportunities for studying the tempestuous motion of storm clouds and the movement of foliage driven by the wind. Yeah, looking at some nice little paintings here. Yeah, maybe one I'd like to do a study of. Um, he does great skies. He does really great trees. One thing I really notice is tree shapes. And, you know, I think someone on the channel had asked me, oh, by the way, before we go much further, we're painting on hardboard. It's got two coats of transparent gesso on it, so it's not just raw hardboard. Of course, the size is 8 by 10 His was probably really big. Um, we did our underpainting, actually, with a little mixture of... Uh, burnt umber and black, which it occurred to me later was very, would be very much like using Van Dyke brown, you know. So I wanted it a little darker, more present, because I did the drawing right before the painting. So a lot of times if I know I'm not going to do that, if I know I'm going to do the drawing one day, drawing slash underpainting that is, and then finish the color portion another day, what I'll do is um, I'll work with a straight up earth pigment like a burnt umber. Um, because it's an extremely fast dryer, so that gives me the ability to really, uh, you know, um, just jump in whenever I want. If I was to use black to do my underpainting, uh, the problem with that is that it, it works really well, but 
um, the drawing is much slower with black and uh, you get a sticky tacky weird thing where actually sometimes as you're trying to paint over it you're actually removing paint it's it's, it's a weird phenomenon I don't recommend it so I, I can and do recommend doing black underpainting slash drawings uh, if you know you're going to wait a while or in this case I was happy to mix in some black because um, uh, what I did was pre-mixed all my colors and then in the morning and then came in the afternoon knowing I'd, I'd do the drawing and then jump right into the color and I knew I could get it done in about the two and a half hours it took me uh, because it's a small painting it's an 8 by 10 um, and it was a and, and fairly straightforward motif anyway what I was going to say before I gave you that uh, information was that I can see in this uh, in this work of his, I can see the influence of Claude Lorraine on the tree shapes. And in the original, which like I say, um, well you could just type, I've copied it pretty much exactly. You could probably put that in a search engine and get your own copy of it if, uh, if you're not in the members area. But um, very crusty with detail. Also his contrasts weren't that great. I probably beefed it up a little. It's hard to say. You know, oh, there was another thing too, by the way. He had a bunch of cows in the pond and their reflections and stuff. And trying to pull something off of like that as an 8x10 would be incredibly fiddly with very tiny brushes. And it's just not the way I operate. Um, perhaps if I was doing it at a much larger size, I might have gone after that. I, I That is the kind of thing, just so you know, that does sell paintings. And, uh, I'm just ornery and, um, you know, don't really care. <laughs> I don't care about the cows, you know. Uh, every, I have painted a cow, uh, one or two paintings I, I can think of, maybe just one. An occasional figure or something too, why not? Especially if it's very simple. I will o almost always tend to do the figures in an NS landscape because they're absolutely critical. Um, and his figures, even lar at large scale, are just these little dots of color a lot of times, so anyway um let's talk about the colors i use since you're you know you're you're a subscriber um i'm thinking um maybe not a member because sometimes the members don't actually even get the to the 15 minute versions um i'm working with ultramarine blue here not my favorite blue but uh, i've just been working with it and I, I can make almost any blue work because let's face it when you're doing a blue for a painting like this a lot of times I'll just use black or gray you know and it gets because it's so cool it gives you that blue feeling especially when contrasted against warmer tones um all the clouds in this are very warm so I did uh, I started with a basic um, well the blue you know a little bit of ultramarine ultramarine here's a big tip for you a great color to chuck in your sky mixes is raw umber and you know I've said this stuff before but we're always getting new folks uh, discovering the channel and stuff so I'll pass that along um, maybe a little bit of uh, yellow ochre um, some white and uh, maybe even a little bit of black you know the thing is with your blue is that um, a lot of painters that are inexperienced their blue they think, oh, blue and white, and they're off to the races. Maybe they'll modulate it. Um, but uh, one of the things about the way I paint is um, the color needs to have a certain level of complexity to it to really feel natural. So that's why uh, to get a nice blue, I'm, I'm, I'm starting with a blue. I'm adding a, a raw umber. I'm adding a white uh, to get the lightness, you know, and then a little black. And this uh, ends up seeming quite muddy maybe on the palette but on the painting itself it's perfect and uh, one of the things that really attracted me to this piece was his sort of crazy sky he did and I love the the muted tones and I love the modulations of tones now um, in the grays most of the his grays and his clouds are very warm although some of them especially as we move down towards the horizon he modulates in the cooler grays um, almost in, back into the blue, you know, where does cool gray end and blue start? That's a good question, eh? Yeah. Um, and I could look at the skies all day, and um, a lot of my paintings tend to feature a bit more color in the sky, but I, I'm very happy to paint stormy types of skies like, like we're here. Um, 
So in uh, let's talk also about uh, <clears throat> he had hundreds of little sky holes, and that's one of the reasons I believe that this is an earlier was an earlier painting of his. Um, you really want to reduce the amount of, like if you're working with photographic reference or um, let's say you're making a study after a master's painting that's much larger you even if you're making a large study after a large painting reducing the number and quantity uh, or, of your sky holes is absolutely critical to creating a nice looking painting and I'm not saying his painting wasn't nice but it's distracting when you see um, the Swiss cheese effect that you get with too many sky holes, especially too many s small sky holes. And I mean, this is one of the things I learned through experience. I could point out uh, paintings even from five or six years ago um, where I was guilty of this. And I knew what I was just telling you. I was reducing the sky holes. I just wasn't reducing them enough. And to the point where you see someone who's a master like uh, George Aness, um, and Dupree, obviously a master too. Um, I'm not not saying anything bad about him. Um, where there might be one or two sky holes in the whole tree shape, and that's actually enough. All you really need to do is establish that some air is coming through. Um, let's talk too about the greens. So his greens were, you know, well within the realm of the types of greens that I like to do. I started with my basic green, which is. Uh, what I call Mike's green, which is an acrylide yellow mixed with black, it gives you a very nice warm natural green. Um, but I almost never use that unadulterated. So in this case, in the darker areas, um, I threw in a little bit of alizarin crimson into that, and I threw in, um, actually, believe it or not, a little bit of permanent green light just to kind of get a green note coming in. And you keep in mind that I've got his uh, painting up in the screen, so. Um, our, as humans, our ability to perceive greens is pretty incredible. There is a very, you know, when you talk about the color spectrum, there's a lot there. And um, there's a lot of different shades. But, you know, if you're a painter starting out, the, the best advice I give you is the same thing. It's like, don't think you're going to make a green uh, by mixing yellow and blue together. And then you're off to the races. And a lot of... Um, teachers in the modern era are teaching you not to mess with black or get into black but black would be the thing that would make all your greens really work very well very very well even if you didn't use black in your shadows or in other ways uh, which I do um, that black and yellow combination starts off with a green that's very natural whereas a blue uh, a blue yellow green just you know it looks like a spring green it's just odd um, and the key to really getting your greens, uh, the first thing I might do with the mic screen, by the way, is uh, almost without even really thinking much about it, is I just start throwing in some burnt sienna. I start throwing in reds. Um, in this case, uh, I tilted the lighter greens in the foliage uh, towards um, with orange. Uh, and um, in the darker areas, uh, you know, a little tiny bit of phthalo or a little bit of blue that kind of thing, black. Um, you notice the tree shape on our left in the back. I wanted to make that slightly different in feel to the other, um, the main tree form on our um, right. Um, and so there I brought in, <clears throat> again, a little bit of that permanent green light, which is a magical color. Um, you can't really use it on its own. It looks really poisonous, but it's really great for modifying and modulating greens. And uh, let's face it, most of this painting is just greens, reddish tones from the earth. Um, my simplified pawn, my pawn is totally simplified if you pull up that reference. And, uh, you know, that's it. But all in all, I'm really happy with the way this turns out. I, I, I quite like it. It was a bit of a challenge, but again, if you want to, if you want to be there, you have a front front row seat for that. Check out the members area. Also, go check out my website. Go buy a painting. Help support M. Francis McCarthy and his art process. We know the world's tough right now, especially tough for artists. Say, eh? you know, people are worried about, you know, the the, the shelves being empty and all the other crazy things going on, you know, you think, oh, I don't need no art right now, I need more food. But, you know, art's still important, and I'm going to keep going, so uh, if you're well off, you know, help me out.
<laughs> anyway, until I come back with another video, do me a favor, do me a solid. Take good care of yourself, your family, your loved ones. Try and be patient with people that have uh, views that differ from your own. And um, take good care. Stay out of trouble. And God bless you and your family.